And what was really exciting about the study is we actually saw that we achieved um, clinic clinically meaningful improvement and statistically significant improvement in the primary endpoint of EFS, which is event-free survival, and also the key secondary endpoint of overall survival. You know, we've had a, a strategy of sort of um, thinking about themes for our studies. And so in the bladder cancer space, we have followed um, rivers. So across the bladder cancer paradigm, you know, we have um, Niagara in this um, intermediate setting. We are super excited about um, sort of the progress that both of those drugs are making. And again, the advancements that we're making for patients. You know, I'm super motivated and excited to see the continued advances to help patients with armament medical need. If I come back to the Niagara study, right, this is the first study to read out in uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer that really um, allows patients potentially in the future to think about an immunotherapy option that can potentially, you know, prolong survival. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Onco Daily. I'm Amalia Sarkisian, and today I'll be your host. Today we have our honor of welcoming Vice President and Head of Immuno-Oncology and GI Tumors Franchise of U.S. Oncology Business uh, Unit of AstraZeneca, Asub Gavil. Thank you for joining us and accepting our offer. It's our pleasure to have you today with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So today we are going to explore some recent breakthroughs and advances in oncology, as well as uh, think about future and what the future holds for us. And uh, do you mind uh, telling us a little bit more about you, your role in AstraZeneca and your background? Yes, I'm um, happy to. So I uh, joined AstraZeneca just over two and a half years ago. Um, I have been in the oncology space for more than 20 years. I started my career as a biochemist on the science side and then moved over um, to the commercial side of the business um, because I was really driven by, you know, bringing patients, you know, new therapies and really seeing the difference that they could make. Um, super excited to be at AstraZeneca and really kind of be a part of our a growing portfolio um, where I really think we're bringing meaningful differences to patients across the realm of different um, targets and agents that we have, immuno-oncology being one of those areas. Yes, thank you for sharing what inspires you to do your work and uh, thanks for the great job you are doing already. And uh, less than a month ago, AstraZeneca announced the results of Niagara trial. It was phase three trial where Durvalumab with chemotherapy demonstrated improved results with event-free survival, overall survival in muscle invasive bladder cancer, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about this trial design, which countries were involved, where did you start, um, and uh, a little bit more details on it? Yes, of course. So um, the study was a global study um, across you know, multiple centers. I actually don't have at hand um, all of the countries that were involved, but there were a number of countries around the globe um, that were involved. Um, you know, it was a phase three study, as you mentioned. We are excited to see, um, you know, the positive high level results that have um, with, that we press released um, recently. And that is um, of uh, infimsy in combination with chemotherapy, um, both in the preoperative and then postoperative setting. So what we call perioperative setting. Um, and what was really exciting about the study is we actually saw that we achieved um, clin clinically meaningful improvement and statistically significant improvement in the primary endpoint of EFS, which is event-free survival, and also the key secondary endpoint of overall survival. And that was versus um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, alone. So, um, you know, I think you might be aware that patients usually will receive um, cystectomy or um, bladder removal um, during this process. So we're really looking at the um, addition of IO before and after that process. So and then again, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can go ahead, please. No, I think, you know, last thing I think that answers your question is this is the first immunotherapy regimen to read out um, this kind of event-free survival and overall survival benefit in this um, bladder cancer space. So why we're super excited about it. Yes, it's very encouraging to hear about it. So this makes Druvalumab the first one to be before surgery and after surgery. And also, as you have mentioned, besides overall survival data, it's also important the quality of life of patients. And if we can preserve from these uh, surgeries, it will be a major success. And uh, so coming back to the results you have shared already, very promising efficacy data, can you share us uh, with us a little bit more about safety data too? What were toxicities? Were they manageable? What were major side effects that you were seeing with this trial? 
Yeah, so at a high level, we know that infimsy was generally well tolerated and the um, safety concerns were consistent with, you know, what you would expect to see in a neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting. Um, there will be more detailed um, safety reading out when we present the data at an upcoming conference, which, um, you know, we're eager to, uh, to see this at ESMO um, in, in the future. Oh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for the results in ESMO. And um, I think this interests a lot of uh, listeners. Why it is called Niagara? What is the story behind it? You know, I don't actually know the answer to that question, except that, um, you know, we've had a, a strategy of sort of um, thinking about themes for our studies. And so in the bladder cancer space, we have followed um, rivers. So across the bladder cancer paradigm, you know, we have um, Niagara in this um, intermediate setting. We're also looking forward in the future to see a, road, a readout from Potomac, which is in an e earlier setting of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And then we're also looking for a readout um, of the Nile study, which is in um, more advanced stages of um, bladder cancer. And so you can see we have a bit of a river theme. I can't tell you where the river theme came from, um, but it does sort of combine our, our bladder cancer approach. Yeah, it actually makes connection with bladder and this false and yeah, it's a nice idea and hopefully we'll get huge results like the Niagara. So you have partially actually answered my next question, which I was going to ask about what are the expected results to be published? So you thought that ESMO will be the first one, we will see the results. And when do you see the end of the trial and uh, when to expect the final ones? You know, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I think, you know, largely, you know, everything being event based, it's hard for us to predict. Um, so we'd have to keep you posted on, on that. Um, I think what's really exciting, though, here is that we're actually already seeing a clinically meaningful benefit um, in overall survival, which is usually what we're waiting for as we're continuing for, to, to wait for readouts of studies. So, um, you know, I think at this at this early stage, seeing those two endpoints read out is, is really um, exciting to see. Yes, uh, indeed. It's, uh, we'll wait for the future and see what it has done. We'll follow up on what happens next and yeah. how but already we are seeing these good results, so we'll, I think, just confirm what we've got here. And uh, it was very interesting about this trial, and let's a little bit go beyond this trial. Uh, your role in AstraZeneca is working not only with this one. And uh, can you share us uh, about some studies that you are most excited for and you are waiting for results in AstraZeneca, and which do you think that could be practice changing? You know, uh, that's a really great question and almost a difficult one to answer as we have um, so much to going on that I am excited about. Maybe I can tell you a little bit about our strategy in terms of how we think about um, trial development at AstraZeneca. And so, um, first of all, as you know, especially with the immuno-oncology portfolio, we're really looking at um, areas of high medical need um, where there hasn't been you know, an opportunity um, for patients to benefit from therapies to now or, or really need an improvement in therapies. And so we look at that across the board, including the advanced setting. And as you already know, we um, we had recently had approvals in the in the cholangiocarcinoma and BTC space, which has been a need area. Um, and I'm really looking forward in that vein to also um, see continued readouts and potentially in the future um, approvals for studies like um, Adriatic, which um, was the first study to read out um, a benefit in the limited stage small cell lung cancer space. So, you know, again, um, really high unmet medical need with um, more than more than, you know, four decades of, of um, lacking in, in advancements for those patients. Um, so that's one area that I think we really we really are excited about. I think the other area is, you know, moving um, earlier into into the disease state, because we really believe that the earlier you can intervene for a patient, the more likely we are to um, have a benefit on longer term outcomes. And so just like Niagara, we have a number of perioperative studies across um, across some indications, um, including the Aegean study in um, resectable non-small cell lung cancer, which has read out. Um, we're hoping um, you know, to bring that to patients um, in the near future. And as also the Matterhorn study, which is in the gastric and gastroesophageal junction space, again, very similar to Niagara, um, where we are incorporating Infimzi with chemotherapy ahead of surgery and then after surgery. And we've seen the initial readouts of that study with PCR results. We are waiting on that study to read out, um, you know, EFS and, and OS. So um, more to come on that study. But an area of, um, you know, real, real kind of focus for us in terms of moving earlier. 
Continuing on that moving earlier kind of thread, we also um, are now looking at a number of adjuvant studies as well. And so I already mentioned, um, you know, uh, or earlier disease studies. So I already mentioned the Potomac study um, in bladder cancer as well. We also have an, um, Emerald 2, which is an adjuvant um, study design in um, HCC or liver cancer, hepatobiliary cancer, uh, sorry, hepatocellular cancer, my, my apologies. Um, and we also have, um, you know, within that earlier space, um, Emerald 1 and Emerald 3, which um, are looking at intermediate patients as well. So slightly earlier than our current indicated space of Himalaya in the hepatocellular carcinoma space. So I think, you know, when you look at our pillars, we're looking at high ambient medical need where we can really make a benefit. And then we're looking to move earlier in, in disease to really try to affect outcomes um, earlier and really improve those longer term survival opportunities. Yeah, thank you for sharing this comprehensive AstraZeneca strategy, I believe. And yeah, just to sum up, so you said that we started with the advanced stage and then we are going to the early stage because we believe that it could be helpful also for early stage diseases, right? If, yeah. Um, indeed, this uh, ASCO was full of uh, results and hopefully we'll see some more updates at ASMA and... Uh, We'll keep updated and hopefully we'll have follow-up calls and follow-up updates on the trials as well. And just mm -hmm. as we are moving through what is done and what is waiting. Uh, mm -hmm. If you already know, Oncodeli had an article about 10 most promising cancer drugs which are not yet approved in solid tumors mm -hmm. in 2024. And for our listeners who are not familiar with this article, we'll put the link in our description. And uh, what is a huge success, I think, for a company too, is that from 10 to we're from AstraZeneca. And it was uh, that of both of our and soon was our trip. Uh, our editorial team believe that these drugs are going to be approved soon. And hopefully we'll have the list which moved these drugs from not approved to approved one. We saw the potential where congratulations on being on this list. And just to share your ideas about it, can you share us a little bit more about these drugs and uh, just in general? And uh, when do you expect them to be moved from the approved list? And if you have uh, on your pipeline more drugs that you think have the greatest potential that to be approved, uh, what would you suggest for our 2025 edition? Yeah, so I think talking about approvals is, is a little bit hard. And, you know, I will certainly say I'm not the closest to the two drugs you mentioned. However, we are super excited about um, sort of the progress that both of those drugs are making. And again, the advancements that we're making for patients. Um, and thank you for, for having us on the list and, and sort of recognizing the portfolio. I think at AstraZeneca, you know, look, we have a bold ambition to eliminate cancer as a course of death. And I think what I when I look at our portfolio, you know, we have we have products that are like the ones you mentioned that are slightly closer to approval. And then we have products that are further away that, are, again, could bring us the next wave in the future. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. When we think about our portfolio, we think about it in terms of really being able to combine mechanisms across multiple different modalities so that we can continue to improve outcomes, you know, hit areas potentially improve those longer term survival benefits, especially if we're able to move earlier and improve the quality of that um, cancer care if we can start to eliminate chemotherapy. And so that's our overall goal. If you look at our um, portfolio, sort of looking into the future, we have, you know, really committed to a couple of areas um, in a big way, including ADCs like DATO, um, as well as um, more a follow on immunotherapies. And I think, you know, for me, I look at that and look at sort of the wave of the bispecifics that are coming in the future. And, you know, we really have an opportunity, hopefully, um, to continue to improve outcomes, but now with one compound or, or regimen versus a, a combination or a cocktail, um, be able to potentially combine within our own portfolio and eliminate chemotherapy and really start to affect um, those longer term outcomes in a bigger way. So, you know, what I will say to your question is we're committed for the long haul. We'd like nothing more than to be put out of business by eliminating cancer. And I think we have a portfolio ahead of us that can really help us do that um, with a multitude of different agents and targets that we can combine. 
Yes, thank you for sharing your insights. And indeed, we are living in the times that this is rapid development, and we have seen uh, moving from chemotherapy to chemotherapy free regimens for a lot of cancers already with very durable responses and results. And hopefully, we'll have more coming. And you, said, you have mentioned that combining therapies and acting could be another key of success to finding the best way to go forward. And uh, hopefully we'll see another drug scene in our 2025 list. Let's uh, keep our fingers crossed. And uh, just on a different road, in the past decades, immunotherapy had a major role in impacting the cancer care and continuing to do so. But within all of these breakthroughs, it is not usually accessible to a lot of population. So how do you see this uh, on the global perspective for low middle income countries, expanded access or maybe expanding clinical trials across the globe? So how do you think making it more accessible? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think it's something that AstraZeneca is truly committed to in terms of really not just bringing therapies to market, but thinking about health equity and access to care, not just in the United States, although, you know, it's as important in the United States, but globally. So we have a number of programs that are ongoing. And, and I will say that, you know, one of the areas that we, we really do focus on is within the United States, thinking about, you know, starting with health equity in terms of access to clinical trials, right as the clinical trials are, are being put into place. And we're, we're continuing to work on that all the way through to making sure that patients have access and various appropriate mechanisms mechanisms that we can. And so um, more work to do. We continue to work on it, but definitely an area of commitment for AstraZeneca. Yes, uh, thank you for sharing this. Hopefully more and more people can have these life-saving drugs because yes, we are already seeing uh, huge potential in these drugs and it changed a lot how cancer treatment is working. And just to sum up uh, from the trial results and so on, I have last question, more personal one. So what keeps you going in this field? It is a drug development, a lot of failure, a lot of uh, drugs are not going to go through, but you are committed and doing what makes you believe in the drugs and do what you are doing. So what is your secret? Oh, I, oh, I don't know the answer to that necessarily. I think, you know, I'm super motivated and excited to see the continued advances to help patients with armament medical need. If I come back to the Niagara study, right, this is the first study to read out in uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer that really um, allows patients potentially in the future to think about an immunotherapy option that can potentially, you know, prolong survival. That's really amazing. And I think that's what really motivates me. Then I look at our portfolio, as we just discussed, and we have a number of those readouts across multiple different tumor areas. And every time it's, it's, it makes us so proud to be able to bring you know, that difference to patients. And that's what really keeps me going. Um, I'm excited for what we have today um, in our portfolio and what we're able to bring to patients. I am, you know, remain motivated by all the readouts we have that allow us to bring more of, the, of this regimen to more patients in different tumor areas where there hasn't been something before. And then as we look forward to our portfolio, I, I really do think that we have the opportunity to continue to really make a difference across you know, multiple different cancer areas. And, and you know, I, I feel very passionate about, about doing that. Yes, uh, that seems like a motivation when you're seeing good results and you will know that you can help and be life-changing and not to one people, person, but uh, a whole uh, population of cancer patients. Yes, it could be a motivation. Thank you for sharing your uh, secret cocktail about uh, being inspired and working and going to all this hard work you are doing. It's incredible. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and being today with us. It was very interesting. And hopefully we'll see more results coming from other trials and we'll follow up on that. And uh, thank you for being us. If you have anything to conclude, we are happy to hear that. No, thank you so much for having me. And, and again, I think we're super excited to, to really bring um, Niagara to now bladder cancer patients with, with the introduction of Infimzy. So hopefully we'll be chatting again in the future as, as that uh, study continues to read out. But thank you so much for the time today. Thank you for being with us and uh, stay tuned on Onco Daily updates on the latest clinical trials. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to Onco Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay update.